So good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining the session. My name is uh, Peter Bühlmann. I'm chairing this session. And I briefly would like to announce that you can raise questions anytime in Q&A and we will discuss the questions after the talk. If there is a very urgent question, I might moderate that and it could be answered during the talk, but that's probably not the case. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Richard Nickel as an invited speaker of the ECM. Richard is born and raised in Vienna, where he obtained also his PhD in 2005 from the University of Vienna. After a postdoc in the US, he moved to the University of Cambridge, UK, where he's currently professor of mathematical statistics. Richard Nickel is a renowned mathematical statistician who has done fundamental work in high dimensional and non parametric statistics and Bayesian theory. His deep contributions to uncertainty quantification and inference have shed light what is possible and what not. Richard Nichols' recent research has also employed mathematical tools from Bayesian non parametric statistics to give the first rigorous statistical guarantees for posterior mean reconstruction in nonlinear, non convex inverse problems arising in PDE models. Together with Evariste Ginet, Richard has written the beautiful book, Mathematical Foundations of Infinite Dimensional Statistical Models, which is truly a tour de force on the subject. Richard has received the Ethel Newbold Prize of the Bernoulli Society, the Prose Award of the American Statistical Association, and he's also the recipient of an ERC Consolidator Grant. Last but not least, Richard is a terrific soccer player, and he's a profound aficionado of Mozart and Thomas Bernhard. Richard, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Peter, for the introduction. And uh, uh, that was uh, very nice. I'm not sure if I'm still such a good soccer player, but let's see. Uh, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of in an overview fashion about some recent work that I've been doing at the interface of uh, sort of inverse problems, PDEs, uh, statistics. Um, I want to just first acknowledge my collaborators here. So that I've had an impressive sequence of PhD students in Cambridge, uh, Kweko Abraham, who is now in Paris, Matteo Giordano is about to move to Oxford, uh, Sven Wang, who is at MIT now, and uh, um, Jan Bohr, who is a third year student. And I also have uh, had like uh, great collaborators with Francois Mona and Gabriel Paternay. And they all really sort of fed into this research program and I learned a lot from all of those, so uh, that should be mentioned at the beginning. Um, okay, so what are we concerned with here? Uh, we have sort of basically in statistical language, we have a regression problem. Um, and what we measure is sort of a, a function, um, g theta at a discrete set of points, um, xi, uh, that sort of discretize some domain or manifold uh, calligraphic x. So each time we make a measurement, we get a yi, but, but we have an, a statistical error, which sort of for uh, conciseness will take this to be a Gaussian error. A lot of what I said here could be, could be done for general errors uh, with other distributions, but it is just, one can exhibit the main ideas in the best fashion for normal errors. Now this data could be real valued if we're measuring a function. We could also be measuring a vector field, in which case this yi would be vector valued. So let's say v is some finite dimensional vector space. And so basically we have a regression function with a family of uh, regression uh, maps that are indexed by some parameter uh, theta in capital theta that we take to be infinite dimensional or if you want after discretization step, uh, maybe high dimensional. Now that would just be a, a common statistical inverse regression model where we want to find theta from some potentially nonlinear parameterization uh, G theta. And the class of parameterizations I'll be looking at uh, 
today and in this talk, and I've been studying sort of recently, is, is when this parameterization comes from an inverse problem involving a partial differential equation. In inverse problems terminology, you typically speak of G as a forward map that sort of maps the space of the parameter space, which is what you want to find into a set of functions, let's say some L2 space on my manifold taking vector uh, values. Um, and, and this is, you know, in, in many of the interesting applications, this map is a solution map of a partial differential equation. So where theta is somehow the coefficient of your PD and, and the G of theta is the solution of the PD. So let's take a, a simple warm up, warm up example. You could think of having some fixed differential operator D that, you know, could be the Laplacian or, or some, some vector field. And then you, maybe you, you study the solution of this when you perturb it by sort of a, a potential. Um, and so, of course, the solution of this PDE subject to some boundary conditions will depend on, on the sort of, you know, potential term you add here, which is theta. Uh, typically, in a simple example, would be an exponential or like a matrix exponential, or if it's the Laplacian, it's sort of a path integral exponential, if you want. So, so this is uh, this map that assigns theta to the solution of the PDE is nonlinear. Okay, so, so it would be a, a class of these PDs already leads to some non-trivial theory that, that we'll see later. But, but obviously in terms of applications, this is a still a very basic example. Um, you can find loads of examples out there wherever you have applied PDs that model some dynamics, possibly with time evolution, um, or if you have X-ray, uh, transform situations, there is a connection to transport PDs um, where somehow the um, the geodesic vector field models sort of the different angles in which you can uh, uh, shoot rays. And, and so wherever you have these PDEs, you have typically data and you have coefficients that you want to infer based on me measurements of the solution of the PDE with noise. And of course, this is a very old problem, um, which has sort of recently received uh, um, sort of a new impetus or momentum thanks to some work by Andrew Stewart on, on the so-called Bayesian approach to inverse problems. Um, maybe there's at first sight a bit of an emperor's new clothes effect uh, as we will see in a moment, because once you understand what this Bayesian approach to inverse problems is, it's actually not that difficult from, from what has been done previously, but then I'll try to convince you that there is some uh, new perspective. Just to set this up, you know, we just have a regression problem. So there's what we call the log likelihood or the least squares fit, which just looks at the, Sort of, you know, sort of quadratic distance um, of your potential solution of the PD indexed by theta from the data you've seen, and then you sum these errors up over all n. Um, now, in this case where the G theta map is nonlinear, this least squares criterion becomes non convex. So, so from a point of view of running standard algorithms, we will have to expect some difficulties here. But before we even go there, um, you know, we need to regularize because theta is infinite dimensional. So you might want to not just minimize this over an infinite dimensional space, but introduce a penalty for two complex solutions, which might lead to overfitting. Uh, that's, of course, a very old idea from regularization and inverse problems. You might know the classical book, Engel, Hank, and Neubauer, and then, you know, the, the people who worked recently on this, uh, like Barbara Kaltenbacher, Otmar Scherz, and, and, and Martin Burger give a and talk about this on Monday. Um, so you need to regularize and, and you then you have to also wonder how to compute in this non-convex setting. But, but you can actually model or understand this regularization step as a Bayesian step where really what you do, you choose a pr prior probability measure on your parameter space theta. And for instance, it could come from a Gaussian process prior, which is sort of an infinite dimensional notion of a normal distribution. Uh, in some function space. And then if you just apply Bayes rule to get the posterior distribution, you get this sort of reweighted version of the likelihood, and then you will have a penalty term that is determined by what we call the reproducing kernel Hilbert space norm of the prior. So in some sense, the prior is just another word um, for the penalization term, which we hear, for instance, in the easiest case, when you take a Gaussian process prior, you just have some squared Hilbert space norm penalty. And then of course you can take other priors and come up with other penalties, but that is sort of the idea. Now in principle, you see now, this is just a rebranding of something that people have done before, but the real difference is that now we don't just have a regularizer, we have a whole posterior distribution. Now, of course, if you take the posterior mode, which maximizes this posterior expression, you will just get what we call the maximum a posteriori estimate, which is just the same as the Tikhonov regularizer that people studied in inverse problems beforehand. Um, 
But there are other things. We cannot try to say things not just about the maximize of the posterior distribution, which actually might not be unique in this case. Uh, we can speak about the spread. We can speak about its quantiles. We could also avoid optimization-based method, methods and instead of computing a maximizer, um, just compute like an average of this posterior surface, which is the mean, for which uh, very different algorithms than variational ones would be available. Uh, and of course, what has been sort of uh, one of the cornerstones of Bayesian statistics is that we can compute such means by very successful algorithms, which are MCMC algorithms. So we kind of get away a little bit from optimization-based inference, which in non-convex problems, of course, can be quite appealing. So for instance, there are, of course, many, many, many MCMC methods. Let me just single out one, which links a little bit to what people in machine learning and, and also in this iterative inverse problems algorithms literature have been doing. Um, if you just take the log posterior density, this is our target thing that we're trying to sample from. Let's call it PN and recall it's just this term here. Uh, then I can just do something that is very similar to a gradient descent based method, but not quite the same. Where you just iterate, um, you start at some initializer and then you iterate according to the gradient directions of this uh, log potential. And every time you iterate, you add a, a Gaussian innovation. This gives you a Markov chain, um, but in, in contrast to gradient descent, uh, stochastic gradient descent methods, this delta here is actually not something that uh, vanishes as k um, goes to infinity. So we're trying to explore um, the whole posterior surface, even sort of asymptotically. Yeah? So if you think of it, this is the Euler discretization of um, uh, stochastic differential equation in d dimensions. So of course, in, I can't quite do this in infinite dimensions, but I will discretize in your favorite way. And then you will implement everything in, let's say, d-dimensional space. And then you would just have a Markov process, which is the solution of this differential equation, which indeed you can show has it targets as invariant measure precisely the posterior distribution. But we're not trying to find a local optimum or something. We'll keep running around the posterior sur surface. So the, the, the danger of being stuck in a local optimizer is, is not really there because we're always going to continue the algorithm. Of course, how fast this converges is something one has to discuss, but, but it's something that is successfully being used in Bayesian inverse problems as a way to compute the posterior mean, for instance, by just averaging the outcomes of this Markov chain as you, you know, after some burning as you run along the chain. Okay, so, so this is a way to implement it. Here are some pictures. We did this on a nonlinear inverse problem with, with uh, um, non-abelian X-ray tomography that pops up in, in neutron spin tomography problem. And you can see here, so in, this is a vector, we're trying to reconstruct a vector field. So there are three functions in each row. You have a sample size of 200, then 400, then 800. And I've run the MCMC 100,000 uh, times. So that takes some time. It's, it's not super fast, but, but this, you know, these are difficult problems. And, and so this can work reasonably well in practice. And um, in fact, Andrew Stewart's uh, Acta Numerica paper from about 10 years ago has had loads of citations and this has really been a successful uh, paradigm of, of solving particularly non-linear problems. Um, of course, not just because we want to get the posterior mean, but because this whole posterior distribution gives us access to more information potentially about, about what we want to find out. And I'll get to that a bit later. Now, this has been around for a while um, and I've been basically the last few years trying to come up with some mathematical theory for whether these algorithms work. Um, and, and what can be said about them. There are several questions you can ask. Uh, I'll single out three of the key questions that I've been working on. The first is just, is this posterior distribution, this updating step that you do from your Gaussian process prior uh, and then giving the data, does it actually work in the sense, let's say there's some real ground truth that generate my data, um, sort of, you know, that really the data has come from a particular value. Um, you know, does the posterior distribution pick this up? The next question, of course, is if it is true, like, can, can I actually, you know, when I draw these MCMC chains, maybe I'm just creating random numbers. So, so is it true that these posteriors are computable in non-convex situations? We, where non-convex means here that the target measure is not log concave. That's sort of dual to saying that the negative log likelihood is not convex. Um, and in particular in high dimensions, it's not clear that such Markov chain Markov chain Monte Carlo methods mix sufficiently well that you can really declare that you've computed the right target. And the third thing, which is maybe the most intriguing thing and also the most useful thing of Bayesian methods is that they give you not just a point estimate, but they give you sort of clouds of curves that you compute along the MCMC. And when you plot them in a picture, as we'll see in a moment, you might wonder whether perhaps 
uh, this gives you an estimate of the error in your reconstruction. It gives you a confidence interval or an error bar, which particularly in applications is very important to be able to say, well, I got my output, but also I can make inference with it in the sense that I know uh, whether I have, you know, how, how far I am away from the truth. And so if you want to answer any of these questions, uh, the first thing to understand is that there is no general off the shelf answer in nonlinear inverse problems. Uh, what you will be able to say will depend on analytical properties of the PDE that describes your forward map uh, G. Um, and both on the global level, the whole map G, but then in particular also the linearization of the forward map at this ground truth value theta zero, where one has to make precise what all this means. But, but you know, so, so these things, at least at the moment, um, cannot be answered in general. And I don't think there are general answers. Let me just run through the first two types of guarantees quickly and give you some references. And then I'll talk about uncertainty quantification most of the um, rest of the talk. So what you can first ask is, now I've computed this whole posterior distribution. Does it actually, so this is a random probability measure. It's still random because of the data. And I can ask myself, does it mostly charge maybe a neighborhood of the true value over here? Yeah, so I could ask myself if I look at the probability under the posterior that it gives to thetas that are further away from the true value more than epsilon n, um, perhaps uh, this is not going to give too much probability to this, particularly as sample size goes to infinity, which tell you, okay, you've computed this posterior and really most of its mass sits where it should be sitting. In this case, we call epsilon n, which is a way to quantify this effect, the contraction rate. And of course, this will be relative to the norm you pick. And once you have a result like this, you can typically also say something about posterior mean vectors, which are the things that you compute from uh, MCMC averages. Um, and there are now a few papers uh, about this that we worked out initially in concrete PDEs. I think the first paper really um, was for these nonlinear X-ray transforms, uh, where we kind of came up with a proof that really works for Gaussian process priors, which in these nonlinear unbounded parameter space settings are tricky. Um, there are follow-up papers after that that investigate other PDEs. There has now emerged some sort of picture for what kind of conditions you might need for general classes of PDEs. Um, and I would uh, mention these two papers if you want to hear more about that. I think that the main message is what do you need to get this posterior consistency result is somehow a notion of quantitative injectivity of your nonlinear forward map, which means that you can actually control the distance in the parameter, um, maybe in a Lipschitz or otherwise held away by the implied distance of the um, regression functions that you actually measure, which are the solutions of the PDEs. Yeah? So, so if you think, that the, for the solution of your PD has, to, you know, the, the map should be injective in the first place, which tells you not yet that there's a modulus of continuity for the inverse map. You want something like that. And it doesn't have to hold completely globally, but it has to hold on a bounded set for your regularization norm. So that tells you if you know something about your PD, maybe it helps you to choose this regularization norm in a suitable way. And like, if you go to any of these four papers, you'll see that the, at some point in the proofs, this stability estimate pops up and it's verified for the concrete PD. Um, okay, so we've understood that. Uh, a bit better now. Um, now, the next question is, can we actually compute these things? So there is a nice uh, paper um, from a while ago, uh, well, not a while ago, maybe seven years ago, by Martin Heyer, Andrew Stewart, and Sebastian Forma, where they show for a particular class of MCMC scheme that I don't want to introduce in detail now, but that is often used in practice, that you can actually get dimension-free spectral gaps for these Markov chains. And then that means you can actually get dimension-free computational guarantees um, uh, under some conditions that are, as you can check in this paper, compatible with the typical PD examples one would want. As long as the sample size n is moderate, which means that the posterior distribution is not yet too spiked. Yeah? So if it is still nicely spread out, then you can actually do it in a way that, that works in any dimension, even infinite dimensions in a way. And this is based on, on sort of a, a Harry's theorem in, in infinite, infinite dimensions for Markov chains, which, which uh, is due to higher uh, um, uh, Mattingly and Scheutzel. Um, now, so this works unless, but it doesn't work in the case that somehow in modern data science is typical where you have a lot of data. And in particular, you would think that uh, having a lot of data, which means N large is the most informative situation where you actually specifically want to be able to compute things because you are in the like precise inference regime. And so that's something we've investigated. And we came up with a condition that works for a class of PDEs. 
um, in these two papers, which you need other conditions that can be checked. But I would say that the key condition is that if you look at the linearization of the forward map at the true value, this induces a linear operator on your on your function space, or if you discretize, say, on, on Euclidean space of dimension D. And what you want is that this somehow, um, sorry, well, this, uh, that this somehow has a lower bound. It has sort of as the quadratic form um, doesn't collapse too quickly. And the price may depend polynomially on, on dimension. So it could be that if dimension is large, that this, this uh, sort of uh, conditioning number may be um, deteriorates, but you have to have some kind of control on this conditioning number. And for these Schrodinger type equations that I mentioned at the beginning, we actually can check this condition by PD theory. I mean, you have to work for this, but it is something that is possible. And in this case, we proved that these gradient based methods actually can solve this problem in polynomial time. They compute the posterior measure and Wasserstein distance at any precision epsilon um, by running only. Uh, in polynomial time in the relevant parameters, which are now n in order to do better than Hager Stewart's formula and d, which is dimension and the precision level. So they, this really overcomes the, the uh, this condition up here really overcomes sort of the, the, the curse of lack of time or convexity. Yeah? And the reason is that if you have this intuitively with high probability, at least locally, you are convex. And then you can show that these posterior distributions actually by statistical arguments charge precisely those neighborhoods where there are log concave. So that in some sense, if you replace the non-log concave measure by a log concave one, the error you make is uh, negligible in the limit. And then you use that these Langevin diffusions, even when you discretize, have very high, uh, have sort of, you know, very fast mixing times, even high dimensions because of the, the, the fact that basically hypercontractivity uh, that comes from probability theory. Um, um, but I, I, you know, one could give a talk just about that fact now, and I won't. Yeah? But but so there are some you know, if you look at these papers, you'll see that we found a concrete class of PDs for which we can even high-dimensional situations argue that these problems are not NP-hard; that they can actually be computed, and not just computed, they be, can be computed by gradient-type methods, which are those that people like to use in applications. Okay, so. I think so far so good. I, I'm sorry I cannot say more about these first two uh, kinds of guarantees, but there's just too much to cover. So I would uh, ask you to just look at the papers. I, I want to now talk about maybe the, the contribution that statistical science really makes to this field and, and that sort of standard inverse problems methods and machine learning methods cannot address, which is really the question of, of quantifying inferential uncertainty. Um, in a reliable way, yeah? So there's even a SIAM journal on uncertainty quantification. What you will see there is that a lot of people do just run base methods and report posterior regions as estimates of uncertainty, but whether these are statistically valid estimates of uncertainty is completely unclear. And in some sense, uh, without further reassurance, this is not scientifically um, well based uh, what, what, what is done there, because there's no reason why a credible set that is generated by a posterior distribution should be valid. Think of the picture here. You know, so, so, so the red curve clouds would be maybe like the last 10,000 MCMC draws that you compute along your uh, MCMC chain, and you just plot them. And then you know you just claim that like the spread of these plots gives you an estimate of how well your construction is around the posterior mode. But the one thing you can't plot in numerical practice is the true function. Now you can do this in simulations like here. And you ask, ask yourself, OK, uh, am I on the right hand side or on the left hand side? Yeah, so you can have a good reconstruction principle, but it could be that there are serious areas where you actually your credible set underestimates entirely the, the spread that it should have in order to contain the true function. So the question is, can we trust such Bayesian methods as statisticians or, or are they just uh, basically random number generators. So, so mathematical way to state the question is, if I choose the quantiles of a credible set, uh, a candidate confident set, if you want, not based on some asymptotic theory, but on posterior quantiles, just what I get from the MCMC chain. And then I look at sort of the status that cluster around the posterior mean, say, or the mode by at most these quantile constants, or if you're in, in some, in some high dimensional space, you could take the ball of the suitable radius. The question is, is the true value uh, sort of when I sample from it uh, contained in that confidence region? So that's the question, can I actually trust my error bars? Um, um, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, is the R number be below one or above one? Yeah? So, so that, that is a question of statistical significance at some significance level, one minus alpha, where you choose alpha. So the question is, if I do this in these PD models, what do I get? 
And uh, well, if you were in a classical finite dimensional model, um, there is a famous theorem that goes back to Laplace originally, and that is uh, called the Bernstein for Mises theorem because Sergei Bernstein and Richard for Mises made some seminal contributions to it. Probably the most general form that one would want is due to Lecam. And you can read up the proof uh, in Art van der Waals book, um, which says somehow remarkably under some conditions that we'll have to discuss is this posterior distribution that you compute, even though it is itself in general, not at all Gaussian and there's no reason why it should be Gaussian. It actually is very well approximated by some normal distribution, um, which is sort of uh, given by one that is centered again at the posterior mean say, or the mode and has a particular inverse covariance which is the inverse of the Fisher information of my model. And you have to assume that this is a non-singular matrix, which can be a, you know, a significant assumption. Um, and you also need that the dimension of your model is fixed. So you have to fix D and let N go to infinity. So this doesn't address high dimensional situations. Also doesn't therefore address infinite dimensional situations. Um, but if you have these conditions and if your prior charge is a neighborhood of the true value, one way to satisfy this condition is to say that it has a positive density on my finite dimensional parameter space. Then actually there's a universal approximation for posterior distributions that tells you that they're always Gaussian. And so in particular, what you can deduce from this is that a credible set that you compute for the quantiles of the posterior actually asymptotically has exactly the right frequentist coverage probability. So in a way, it's a Bayesian way of bootstrapping the quantiles of the limiting distribution. Um, and, and so it, it's a universal way to actually construct confidence regions that are scientifically accurate uh, to base them just on the posterior distribution. So the Benjamin from Mises theorem is a, is a very powerful tool for various purposes, but in particular, it justifies that Bayes' incredible sets are perfectly valid from a frequentist point of view. Now, if you look at the assumptions here, um, if you do this game in high dimensions or infinite dimensions, it is really not clear whether, you know, what remains of this theorem. Um, well, that's something that I've worked on in direct models, not for inverse problems or so maybe a while ago. And we do have like uh, with Ismail Castillo, we, we found a way to formulate such results also in infinite dimensions. And one of the most like recent projects uh, that, that we've uh, done now with uh, Francois Monat and Gabriel Patanine was to extend this term to, uh, to an infinite dimensional PD setting. Um, and we'll give examples in a moment, but roughly, if your forward map is sufficiently regular in a way that I don't describe in detail now. And let's say I don't want to initially just reconstruct the whole parameter theta, but let's say I just look at its action on a test function psi, that is maybe say a smooth test function, a C infinity. Um, and so of course, as I run through all psi's, eventually I somehow reconstruct my whole object. And if I can quantify this, I can maybe get some convergence in function space even, but let's just say I test all this sort of, uh, um, psi is lying in a convergence determining class. And I look at the deviation of the posterior from the posterior mean, which is now a, a scalar uh, sort of random variable conditional on the data. I can actually prove that this converges to um, again, a normal distribution. So note that in, in this nonlinear setting, the posterior distribution is of course not at all normal. And so then also if I take a linear functional, if I like, even if it's nice and smooth, this will not be a normal distribution. This is something not normal, but in the limit, these statistics start to look Gaussian again. Um, and what is it? So mean zero is okay. The covariance is the interesting bit. So there is some analog of the inverse Fisher information, which is now calculated by tools from semi-parametric statistics. Um, and what you see here is that this is what we call the information operator, which is now a mapping between function spaces. And this is now, you, know, you have to solve an equation here when you want to define this inverse, which means that you have to solve a new PD where somehow the ingredients of the PD you have to solve come from the original PD, G and its linearization. So this is really, here's the point where you hit new PD questions that sometimes in this form haven't been asked before. And where also some of the more pure collaborators I have sort of got interested. Um, so for this Schrodinger type equation from the first slide, when you have a Laplacian perturbed by potential, I could prove this by using elliptic PD techniques. You know, you just sit down and, and knock your head against the wall until you know enough about elliptic PDs. And, and, and in this case, it was possible to prove that somehow by myself, that this in, inverse Fisher information, at least for one example, really exists. Um, already, if you look at the x-ray case, this becomes much more difficult 
because in this case, uh, there is no explicit interpretation of this information operator any longer. You can show it's a pseudo differential operator of order minus one in the interior of your domain, um, but, but you need to deal with the boundary behavior. And, and there are some real subtleties here um, that, that sort of Gabriel Paternine and Francois Monat, my co-authors sort of were able to address. You can look at the papers for details, but but so in this case again, we were able to actually show that this inverse Fisher information uh, up here actually exists, and so therefore you also have a bench from Mises theorem, and in particular credible sets that you compute from the posterior distribution, at least for these actions on test functions psi, um, will be valid confidence sets as a consequence of this theorem. Um, now, of course, you ask yourself. Is this just a general hypothesis? If you go to the classical bench and from Mises theorem in parametric models and to what people write in textbooks in mathematical statistics, you just say, assume the Fisher information is invertible. Um, well, you can assume that, but if your forward model comes from a concrete PD, this is not an assumption. It's something that is either true or false and you need to check it. Yeah? So you need to do mathematics. You can't write an assumption. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Yeah? So it's something that you need to decide by studying the problem. So here we found two classes of PDs where we could prove that this actually works. Um, but uh, there will be others where you know it may or may not work. And I'll actually come to a counter example in a moment. Um, but before I do this, I just want to show you that these terms are not just asymptopia. So we, we run this uh, um, here for three different choices of test functions psi. Um, in the non-abelian X-ray example, um, I think with 600 sample size. So what do you have here? So you have the green dot is the posterior mean. The black dot shows you the one sigma quantile of the posterior distribution. And typically, if you think of 95%, you're going to be more like uh, over here or here. And the red dot is sort of the true value of this particular functional um, given a concrete choice of psi for three different psi. And you do see that even for this moderate sample size of n equal to 600, um, the, the bulk of the posterior mass really does cover the true value in all of these cases. Um, and, and so in some sense, this story about uncertainty quantification coming from, from the posterior being valid uh, uh, can be justified both in theory and in, in numerical evidence. Um, and I think this is, you know, if you think that these are highly non-Gaussian posterior distributions where really you, you, know, you start with a prior, that is a Gaussian process prior, then your forward model already for the PDE because the forward map is non-linear. So your actual prior on the regression function is highly non-Gaussian because you apply a non-linear PDE solution map to a Gaussian process. Then you condition on the data as another non-linear step. So, so there's really no reason why this should be Gaussian, um, but it is, and both the theory and, um, the numerical evidence show that this is the case, at least in settings when the information operator has this uh, inverse. Yeah? Now, you know, as you go along, so these PDs that we first found were those that we that we chose somehow. Well, they have real applications in photoacoustics and neutron spin tomography, but but we mostly chose them because we, we could find a way through the mathematics. Um, and uh, now here's just a example that is studied very frequently in applied mathematics that you find in lots of papers. Um, where, and, and so, you know, we wanted to understand what's happening in this example because there are so many papers about it. So we studied this a little bit in the, in the last uh, half, like six months or so. So what is the problem is like a steady state diffusion equation. So you, you have a divergence form elliptic operator um, and you want to find the conductivity theta that sort of models the, the steady state diffusion. Um, you have some right-hand side F, um, and this is like an equation on some bounded domain X, um, elliptic PD with some boundary functions if you want. So and, and if, if this source is positive, um, you can actually show that you have some global stability estimate for this forward map that comes from the solution of this elliptic PD. And we have a paper with Matteo Giordano where we show that Bayesian methods are consistent if you base them on Gaussian process prior. So you get some non-parametric convergence rate and you can infer theta at, a, at some rate if, if it's regular enough. So in particular, if I assume it's smooth for simplicity, then there's really no problem. Yeah? So as you can get the Bayesian method to work in terms of algorithmic recovery. It's also computable. So you have enough sort of, uh, curvature and the posterior, one can show that too. But the question is, you know, if I want to, to get this 
justification of uncertainty quantification, I actually would want to go further and prove a bench and Prometheus theorem. And then you run into this question of whether I can actually invert um, this inverse of the information operator. Yeah, so you can, of course, compute this, this linearization just by perturbation of the base PD. But what we prove here is somehow surprising, but it's fact that in this case, even so, so, so let's take a simple model. You know, when you do negative results, you, you want to choose a simple base example where things are clear. So let's say the boundary temperatures are zero. So it's a standard Dirich Lake conditions. And the right hand side here, F is just constant, say, equal to two. Yeah? Now, so this is a very nice sort of simple elliptic PD. And, and now let's suppose I want to just as before, I want to test against a smooth psi. But let's say it's non negative. And maybe support it somewhere in like in the upper quadrant of the disk. Yeah? So my domain is the disk. Um, so that then on the other side of the other quadrant, there's going to be one straight line from the origin to the boundary where it actually vanishes. And actually, if I take any smooth non-negative psi that vanishes along one straight line connecting the origin and the boundary, then we actually can prove by using a theorem of van der Waard from um, about 30 years ago that gives general. Uh, make, like conditions for non-existence of the Fisher information, uh, well, of the inverse of the Fisher information, that there is a basically an exhaustive class of smooth test functions psi for which I cannot have uh, non-zero Fisher information. And in particular, it is impossible to estimate that the root n rate is functional, even just in the case where my parameter theta is the simplest of all, equal to one, where this divergence form operator collapses to the standard Laplacian. Yeah, so, so I think what this shows in particular you cannot have a result like this one here where I get for all smooth test functions uh, convergence to a normal. And so for theory, I will not in this example have convergence in function space. Um, so then I cannot also at least mathematically conclude that the uncertainty quantification that the base method provides for the conductivity parameter can be trusted. There might be other ways to prove these things, but not on the root of a bench and for Mises theorem, simply because the limit distribution uh, doesn't exist because the Fisher information is actually zero. Um, and this, it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, we're writing this up at the moment, but what it should, I mean, and on a deeper level, it has to do with the fact that the information operator doesn't necessarily have closed range. And, and then, you know, in the other examples, you have ellipticity, which helps you with this. But, but what it should surely tell you is that if you want to draw from the classical toolbox, of mathematical statistics justifying base methods in these PD examples, you, you have to be careful um, because whether or not you can actually determine that the relevant quantities that pop up in these terms, like the inverse Fisher information exist, uh, might you know not just lead to PD questions that you can't solve, but it might actually lead to PD questions that have no solution. And so, so just maybe to conclude, uh, I've certainly learned a lot in the last few years by trying to confront this PD world with uh, an inverse problems world with what we sort of know in, in mathematical statistics. I do think that this Andrew Stewart approach that is now around for 10, 12 years does have certainly some merits also from a mathematical point of view. You can actually show that these things do work um, even in nonlinear settings uh, if you can analyze your PD. Um, sometimes the analysis of the PD and, and also what you need from high dimensional statistics can run quite deep. But I just want to emphasize there's certainly no off the shelf theorem, like a classical bench and from theorem that just tells you everything is fine. You can use this. So I think in a, in a way, the, 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 the problem you study needs to have some favorable properties like this, like a differential operator perturbed by some potential is probably a favorable situation because the parameter lives on a zero order level. Uh, doesn't interact with the first and second order differential terms. And, and these are settings that we can usually handle. Uh, there are some other PDs, like the one with this divergence form equation that I just mentioned, where, where it's not so clear uh, how you're going to justify base methods. And certainly, we're just at the beginning of everything. So uh, um, there's much more to be done. Um, and just to wrap up um, in the last minute, so if you want to read up a little bit on, on what we've done, it's, it's unfortunately because it's a, it's a continuous learning process. This is all a bit scattered at the moment. I'm, I'm actually coming to visit uh, ETH Zurich hopefully next year, and I'll write some lecture notes on this material then. Um, so hopefully there will be something more introductory at some point. But the consistency papers are basically these three. On the maybe this last bench and from Mises paper is a good point to start uh, for, for sort of the general story. 
And uh, if you're interested in these computational guarantees, this will be the last two papers, um, which are, are haven't appeared yet, but are sort of in review. Um, yeah, I, I think my time is over. So uh, thanks for, for your attention. <laughs>